In 2021, Apple is pushing M1 products on you like there is no tomorrow, but they do continue to sell Intel equipped products. It has been over a year since I first opened the lid and I initially praised the product in my three month review. But over time, how has my opinions on this product changed? And is this product you should buy in 2021? Hey, I'm Chris Wilmshurst, and this is my 16 inch MacBook Pro. I picked this up as soon as it was released at the end of 2019, and I configured it with the top of the range eight core i9 CPU, 32 gigabytes of RAM, the top of the line graphics chip, the 5500M, and I decided to stick with the one terabyte of storage space. It's been an absolute workhorse for me, and I've put this thing through hell. I've used it to produce hundreds of videos, edit photos, audio editing, project planning, remote working, and so much more. I will honestly say I've got my money's worth with this thing, but it hasn't come easy. When it comes to the software I use, I've always stuck with Adobe Creative Cloud. Yes, it can be buggy at times, but so can all things. But I also own a PC, and I don't want to be locked into the Mac ecosystem if this ever fails. With Adobe, I'm safe in knowing that I can install it on my PC with the same license and carry on. Albeit a bit slower than I would normally, but I have that security. Editing in Premiere Pro has always been smooth for my day-to-day -day work. My workflow consists of shooting an S-Log2 with two adjustment layers for color correction and a Rec. 709 LUT. This obviously adds another layer of demand on the system, and fortunately for me, it's been able to handle it just fine. I'm always editing in a quarter quality, as if I'm not using the built-in screen, I have it hooked up to a 1080p gaming monitor. Other Adobe programs like Photoshop have never skipped a beat, but Lightroom Classic has given me a few issues in the past. It tends to be sluggish when working with a large photo collection or when I'm batch processing images. One issue I recently discovered was that iPhone footage is so painful to edit in Premiere Pro. There were times where it would drain all my system memory and cause the whole machine to crash and shut down. I'd never have this issue with the clips from my camera or my drone. It's only when I used iPhone clips. For these clips, I'd have to transcode them to a different format and consistent frame rate. Then I'd be able to actually edit them. I've been told this isn't an issue in Final Cut Pro as I believe that it takes full advantage of the T2 chip and that speeds up the H.264 footage. As editing is so demanding on the system, any sort of creative work would switch the internal graphics on the Intel chip to the Radeon graphics chip. This is where noise and heat become such a huge issue. I stated this in my three month review video, but over time, the noise and heat has gotten a lot worse. Obviously, the buildup of dust over time will have this effect, but I can't say it's nice to listen to when it's less than two feet away from me. If you've ever used Warp Stabilizer on Premiere Pro, you'll know how intensive that thing is, especially when you use detailed analysis. This would drive my MacBook Pro wild. If you're familiar with my channel, you'll know that we picked up a base model M1 Mac Mini several months ago, and that little box of dreams is absolutely silent. Even under intense strain from a Rosetta emulated game, it doesn't make a single sound. When I'm sat in front of the TV and I see it daily, I end up looking over to my obnoxiously loud and hot 16 inch Pro and think, why the hell don't I sell you and switch to an M1 Mac? It costs almost five times as much and it can't even keep quiet. I will go into why I don't soon, so stay tuned. But I do want to touch up on something that I think is highly underrated, the touch bar. The touch bar is something people debate all the time. I think it's great when it works. The shortcuts for Premiere Pro are helpful, and I'm not fussed about having to hit a media key to change a track. And I like that I can scrub through videos in Safari, and the screenshot tools are really helpful. Unfortunately, it doesn't work all the time, and after being docked for a while, it will sometimes be locked to F1 to F12. There's no way to change it. Even switching apps doesn't have an effect. The only way to fix it is to kill the process in terminal or by restarting. It's really irritating when you're in the zone working on something and you're forced to break concentration and troubleshoot an issue that shouldn't be there after all these years. But I do think it is a very useful tool when it works. It's just a shame not more apps make use of it. The keyboard is one of the nicest I've ever used on a laptop. There's no broken keys, it types smoothly, and I've yet to have any issues with it. Touch ID is absolutely fantastic, and the trackpad still can't be beaten. I honestly can't complain about any of these features, as they just work. I tend to use my MacBook Pro in clamshell mode a lot. 
I have it docked to a Thunderbolt 3 hub 90% of the time. Having my MacBook Pro hooked up to this hub fixes one of the main issues people have with Apple's MacBook line, and that's the ports. Mine has four ports, and before I started building up a collection of backup drives, I never used more than three ports at once. One for the charging cable, a USB-C to SD card reader, and a USB-C to HDMI cable. It was only once I started needing to access multiple drives that it became essential I pick up a Thunderbolt hub. But that's where my thoughts on ports took a turn. Having one cable connected to my MacBook changed everything. All my hard drives, my monitor, audio interface, power, and Ethernet connection go into my Thunderbolt 3 hub and then my MacBook Pro can take full advantage of everything it has to offer. But the best accessory to complement any Mac in my opinion is right here, it's the Apple Watch. If you're docked, you don't need to worry about Touch ID and people wishing for Face ID, despite me being one of them, it's no longer needed. The Apple Watch is your golden key. It unlocks your Mac if you're close to it and it can authorize Apple Pay payments. It's a fantastic feature and more people need to shout about it. When I'm not docked, I absolutely love the screen. It's fantastic for color correcting videos and photo editing. It's bright, the resolution is good and the overall size is perfect for sitting on your lap or at a table. I touched on AirPlay in the past and I'm sad to say I've barely used it since my last review on this. My TV supports all the services I could want, even Apple TV Plus, and I find it too laggy to use for creative purposes like video editing, despite being sat right next to my wireless hub. Which leads us into Sidecar, which is great when I use it for large projects where I have hundreds of clips because it's a fantastic media browser in Premiere Pro, but outside of that I don't use it as it suffers too much lag on wireless and I don't want cables trailing all over my desk. Storage has actually been the biggest issue with this MacBook Pro. Since work's picked up, I have to empty about 600 to 700 gigabyte off my MacBook every month. I'm always conscious about whether I'm gonna run out of space and when I'll have to buy another external drive. It's the one regret I have about this machine. My RAM usage is fine, the CPU is great, the rendering and graphics performance is optimal, but my storage is far too little. I should have gone for the two or four terabyte option. Now I may be saying a lot of negative things compared to my original review, but I did say this video was how my opinions have changed over time. My Auschwan Smart XR video almost broke me and my love for it. It took way too long to complete. The noise and crashes just were too much for me. However, Adobe is not fully M1 compatible yet and it won't be for a while. They do have a roadmap and betas currently available to try out but as I'm someone who uses this machine for professional work and relies on a quick turnaround and most of all, reliability, it's absolutely essential that I stick with what works. And if you're someone who does rely on a machine for work and an income, I'd suggest doing the same. Now you could counter that argument with the huge improvements that the M1 brings. You've got longer battery life on the MacBook line, faster USB that can take full advantage of the speeds that NVMe drives offer because if you didn't know, the 16 inch and Intel MacBook Pros max out at 10 gig a second over USB-C Thunderbolt, whereas the M1s reach 20 gig. So drives like this OWC Electron I have are actually slower on my 16 inch Pro than they are on the M1 Mac Mini. You're getting better power efficiency, which I should also mention the battery life on my 16 inch is terrible. I get about two hours tops when unplugged and editing. And if I'm doing general day-to-day -day tasks and browsing, I'll probably get about three and a half hours max. It's such a contrast to the insane all day battery life that the M1 MacBooks can bring. But then it ultimately comes down to your personal needs. The enthusiast in me wants all the latest and greatest Apple has to offer. But the more sensible side of me that doesn't come out too often is telling me to wait and hold off until Adobe is fully Apple Silicon ready and maybe wait for a rumored 16 inch M1 MacBook Pro. If you don't use your machine for work, I'd say go for the M1. But if you do use it for work, Stick with what you've got, maybe consider a second-hand 16-inch Pro, or just take the risk. You might be alright with it. So, thank you for watching. Let me know if you're still using an Intel Mac below, and if you're considering switching to Apple Silicon, well, good luck to you, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Take care.